Talk Radio. Welcome, world. Welcome once again to Tuesday Talk with Key West Lou. I am your host, Louis Patron. Well, there isn't much to talk about these days. There's really only one thing. Worldwide, nationally, statewide, in every city and town and village in this country, and it's coronavirus. That's all there is to talk about. It has taken control in a very short period of time of our lives, our lives. Uh, Would you believe? I have been self-quarantined for 28 days. Not because I was sick, because I didn't want to get sick. Uh, You know, they say, watch out, if you're old, you're done. Uh, I'm 84 years old. Uh, I have uh, a heart condition. That's not healthy. And I have underlying problems. So I decided I'd have to play safe and secure with myself. And I have been in this house, have not stepped out once in 28 days. No one has been permitted in my home. Uh, It's not bad. Of course, I'm fortunate. I I research and I write. I'm just doing twice as much as I used to do before I started the quarantine. But it keeps me busy. Uh, So tonight we're going to be talking about the, the virus quite a bit. And in so doing, we're going to be traveling to Switzerland, Washington, New York, Baltimore, Illinois, and Key West, Florida. I want to start with the World Health Organization and Donald Trump. Without a doubt, Trump is the worst president this country has ever had. I can't believe it will ever have one any worse. He, the man, he lies. <laughs> he screws everything up. And he's never at fault. No one is so perfect as he is. Everyone else is a screw-up. So let's start this way. When Trump became president three and a half years ago, one of the first things he did was cut out of the budget our annual contribution to the World Health Organization. The World Health Organization, I think, has 165 countries that belong to it. And each country makes a contribution, and they do medical research. They worry about epidemics that may be coming, and they warn you, and they help you, et cetera, if you do get involved in one. Well, he didn't think it was worth the money, and he zip, he gives them. He cut the budget out. Well, now comes COVID-19, and uh, we don't know at the time that he cut them out of our budget, but the World Health Organization immediately said, uh, President Trump, we are prepared to give you, had to pay for it, of course, but we have test kits, and we will supply you with test kits. I could not understand for the life of me why Trump said, we don't want your test kits, at a time when we didn't have test kits. He says, no, we don't want your test kits, and the excuse he used was they had been found defective in other countries in the world. Uh, Turns out, They'd never been found effective anywhere. We would have had, in either late December or sometime in January, we would have test kits. Look where we are today. We still do not have an adequate supply of test kits. The most important thing, next to the ventilator, if you do get the disease, is the test kit. Our people aren't being tested in the numerical numbers that a country with 320 million should be. And he just keeps saying, I, I, I listen to Trump now. We all listen to Trump. And he says, what was it? He started about six, seven weeks ago. We got a million coming by next Friday. <laughs> and next Friday comes and he says, well, we got a million for next Friday. And it's always on the come. We, I think in the sixth week we got up to, we got four million coming next Friday. We got diddly dip, okay? How many did we get? Have we gotten a million yet? I don't know. But even a million, what does it do with a country with 320 million people? He should have taken the help from the World Health Organization. For some reason, he did not. Now, today, what does he say on television? Because he's got this reality show going every night at 5 or 6 o'clock. And uh, he said, you know, He made some adverse comments about the World Health Organization. One of the reporters asked him some question. I I don't recall the specifics, but it had to do with the World Health Organization. And he, you know, he put on that solid, hard face, and he says, there is a problem with WHO, okay? They are too close to China. 
Well, if they are, who the hell cares? You know, they're there to help everybody. If they, I would assume they would help us and they would help China. They'd help every country. That, that's the way they are. That's the way they operate. This isn't a pro-Trump organization, the World Health Organization. But, no, they're too close to China. And when some reporter said, well, how are they too close to China? He said, he waved his arm and went to another reporter for a question. He's a troublemaker, my friends. He's a bad man. He's an evil man. Why God inflicted on him, on him on us, I don't know. I'll tell you this. Every one of you that voted for him three and a half years ago should be ashamed of yourselves. It was so obvious how bad the man was. But you wanted a tough man for president, someone who was going to change things. Well, he is a tough guy, and he has changed things, and he has changed them to the worse for all of us. Okay, now let's talk about this last stimulus package that got passed. This was a big deal. And it is a big deal. Was it $2.5 trillion, $2.8 trillion? That's a lot of money. And we've got to come up with this. Boom, boom, boom. We already had one, 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 one stimulus before. We've got, we're coming with a third, a fourth, or we've got the third. We're going the fourth. It gets confusing. But the last stimulus package was one of the first things to do was to put money in the pockets of the working people working people, and into small businesses. And it was going to be done right away. Boy, did he sell us a bill of goods. Did the Republicans sell us a bill of goods. And I'm going to tell you this, too. The Democrats did also because they bought his horseshit, okay, that this was going to be done right away. And what's happening now? We've had this, this new stimulus package over a week. Tell me one small business person that has gotten a loan. And this was supposed to be easy. The small guy walks into the bank, says, I've got this business. Boom, boom, boom. I need money. And they would work it out. Well, the day the money was available and everyone could start, they went in. And the banks didn't have the paperwork ready. The banks didn't know precisely what they had to do. So what the banks did, they set standards by which the small business person had to provide information, the same type of information that General Motors, all right, would have to, to present, okay, or Chrysler, any of the big companies. <clears throat> small businessman doesn't keep books like that. He doesn't have an accountant or accountants with an SN staff full time. He doesn't know how much he spent for this or for that. He just knows he's been in business for 10 years on this corner uh, with a food stand or something, and he needs help. Well, they can't do it because they don't have the information and they haven't gotten instructions yet that they can do it with less information. So the small businessman still hasn't gotten his money. And this would be such a a nice deal because if you keep, by the way, I think if you keep 80% of your employees, they will make a loan for three months. Uh, The government will make a non-refundable loan. If you have eight employees in this program and you make a loan, you don't have to pay the money back. What could be better than that? Maybe that's why I know the small business guy isn't getting his money. Trump doesn't want to see him. <laughs> They're going to pay it back. It doesn't make sense. None, none of this makes sense to me, and I'm sure it doesn't make sense to you. So, And the guy, the small working person, uh, of which there are so many in this country, you're going to get your check. You're going to get a check, what is it, 1200 a month, your wife too, and the children 500 a month. I think you're going to get this for two months or three months, and this is going to keep you going. Have you, has anyone seen a check in this country yet? It's been about two and a half weeks since this program got passed. The checks were going to go out right away. You know, if you had filed your income tax return, they were going to send them that way. Uh, then they found out that that didn't cover people like me. Who's, I'm on Social Security. I don't even file a return. Haven't filed a return in years. Well, they're going to send it to, to people like me, too. But no one's got a check. No one's got a check. And the rent came due a few days ago. And I, don't, I haven't heard of any landlords, very few landlords, if any, saying, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I can wait for my money. Because that landlord has to pay the bank on the mortgage. What they should have done, and I wrote about this and I talked about this a month ago, the banks should have a moratorium on collecting on the mortgages. 
And the landlord should have, a, if he's getting that benefit, he doesn't have to pay on the mortgage, should not have, should give a moratorium to his tenant not to have to pay the rent during this terrible times, these terrible times we're going through. But it isn't working that way. And this is Donald Trump's government, you know, and these are his people. And I knew it wasn't going to work because even if the Democrats were in, <laughs> these packages never work the way they are supposed to. Now, let's move on to something else with the, with this stimulus thing. It's also going to provide money for the big companies, the major corporations, because after all, we've got to keep the airlines in business. They're not going to be flying because no one can fly if the disease is out there, but we've got to give them money because they're not flying. The cruise ship lines, my God, we can't make them go out of business. <laughs> and I totally disagree with all this, by the way, but that's another story for another day. Anyhow, let me show you how one of the companies that would get money, uh, what they did recently. Goldman Sachs, major financial company in the United States, Goldman Sachs, big money, put big deals together. They're eligible for money under the program. You know, if their cash flows off or they lost something here or there, and I'm sure with all the accountants they have, the CPAs, the tax lawyers, the corporate lawyers, they're going to be right up front there. Let me tell you what happened with Goldman Sachs. And this is in the last week, okay, in the last week it was announced uh, what the numbers show for 2019. 2019, just three months ago it ended, for the year 2019. Goldman Sachs has never had their own corporate jet. They are probably the only major corporation of any type in the United States that has never had a corporate jet. They showed a good image. Well, what do you think they did last year? They bought two corporate jets. They bought two top-of-the-line Gulfstream jets, $75 million apiece, 75. Never had jets before. They used to rent time on private jets when they had to take a special trip. Now they got their own at $150 million, two corporate jets. Well, that's not so bad, I guess. But here, their, their CEO, his name is David Solomon. He is the CEO, and he's dealing in big money, and he makes big money. Let me tell you the financial package they gave him as of the end of 2019. This was his reward. By the way, Goldman Sachs, Goldman Sachs did not have a good year last year. It was one of their poor years. They were not a business or even close to it, but it was not one of their better years. And <laughs> coronavirus wasn't the problem. I don't know what their problem was, but they didn't have that good of a year at a time when the market was at an all-time high. So, But the president... He got his financial uh, package at the end of the year. His reward, because the board of directors thought he did a good job. And here's what David Solomon got. He received a package, hold on to your seat, of $27.5 million. That was his compensation package, $27.5 million for 2019. $2 million was in salary alone, $7.65 million was a cash, cash bonus, because he did good, <laughs> and they didn't have one of their better years, and he got $17.85 million, $17.85 million in long-term incentives. What a great country we live in, isn't it? Terrific. Uh, while the guy, the small businessman on Main Street is going out of business. Very simple. Uh, let's see. Trump, he always impresses me. He says things some, with such seriousness sometimes. Uh, it was just yesterday, uh, because we know this is supposed to be the week that was. This is going to be the worst week. We're going to have the most deaths this week. Uh, we're, hopefully we're going to plateau and then come, start coming down. I don't know who's right. I don't know who's wrong. I'm sure we'll beat this thing, but I don't know how much longer it's going to take. It's got to take at least two or three months longer, if not longer. But Trump yesterday said, and very, with very serious face, there will be deaths. There will be deaths. Isn't that impressive? I want to tell you, I, what Donald Trump should do, I don't think he appreciates the severity of the virus. All right? He lives in the White House. 
He hasn't gone to Mar-a-Lago in a couple of weeks, but I'm sure he's going to get down there eventually. And he's protected from everything, okay? He's protected from everything. He should go to New York City to see how the real people are living and what is happening. He should walk through those hospital corridors and see the people lying on floors that have been there for days being treated or on some kind of guineas. Uh, He should see the people choking for air who don't have a ventilator. He should see the doctors and nurses who are working 13-hour shifts seven days a week. They're first responders. They're right up there. He should see the trucks, the trucks, the transport trucks outside the, the you know, they're, they're the coolers, the big coolers, where the bodies are being stored. Seven, eight of these transports at a time because there's no place to take the bodies. All right? Then he would really understand what's going on. And when he says there will be deaths this week, it would have meaning to him because these things have to have meaning to him. He's numero uno. He's the head of this country, and he should be doing a hell of a better job than he is doing. Okay, now this brings me to our doctors and nurses who are working in these hospitals. Uh, They are... Our first line of defense. Uh, They're special people. Uh, They are the first responders. And you know what they really remind me of? Think back to D-Day Normandy. You've seen movies on this if you're not as old as me. They are the ones who hit the beaches first in Normandy. They are World War II. They are the first to hit the beaches in Normandy. So far in this country, over 100 doctors and nurses have died combating coronavirus in the hospitals. Now, we come to what I describe as social unrest. Social unrest. This is going to blow your mind. Let's see now. We, the last time we really had problems with the banks where the banks were going out of business because we saved our asses in 2008, so I won't even talk about that, was the Great Depression uh, started in 1929 and went into the 1930s. Uh, the banks were going under there, definitely. And there were uh, rushes on the banks. They call them run on the banks. People wanted their money. They knew the banks were going out of business. They wanted the depositors wanted their money out. Whether it was $100, $20, $10,000, they wanted the cash out of their savings accounts, okay, out of their checking accounts. And the banks couldn't do it. They didn't have enough money, all right? And the banks went under and the people got nothing, all right? Now, we're into social unrest again. I spoke about 10 days ago, and I wrote about this 10 days ago, that we're going to have bank failure. There's going to be rushes on banks. It's inevitable. And I got a lot of negative comments back. Uh, I get many negative comments in writing. You're a horse's ass, et cetera. Uh, even worse. But anyhow, it doesn't bother me because at least people are thinking. Uh, in any event, uh, people didn't believe me. Well, I think, here's why I think it was coming, I said then, and what's happening now. Ten days ago, uh, maybe two weeks ago it was, when the market really crashed, went down like close to 2,000 points in one day, employees working in financial houses in mid-Manhattan made a run on two major banks in their neighborhood and drew cash out in the thousands and hundreds of thousands of dollars. So, and they wanted it in cash. They didn't want a check, a certified check or anything. They lined up and they wanted cash. And the banks ran out of $100 bills. (laughs) It was amazing, but they, they paid everybody, but they ran out of $100 bills. Now, you didn't read about this that much in the paper, if at all, or on the media, because we've got to keep these things quiet. You want the rest of the country to go crazy, the poor people who put their savings in that that, that bank, okay, Uh, and don't even get interest on it anymore. So this is social unrest. Now, last, and this is, there's an evolution to this social unrest. It didn't didn't become, I'm sorry, it did not begin with the banks. 
there's a panic that's associated with it, and it started with the with hoarding, the hoarding of the 3M and 95 masks, then the hand sanitizers, then the non-perishable foods. Okay, and I tell you, we're going to run out of foods. I talked and wrote about that last week, and if I have time tonight, I'll hit it again. And then people are buying guns and ammunition. Two weeks ago, in one week, in one week, the sale of guns across the United States was up 400%. Now, why are people doing this? Because they know the bad times are coming, and we're going to have disturbances on the streets. I absolutely believe this. And they're out there to defend themselves and their families and maybe even get their own if they have to, to survive for themselves and their families. Now, what about bank runs now? Now, more recently, not the mid-Manhattan one a couple of weeks ago or a couple of months ago, two weeks ago, two weeks ago on a Saturday, there was a bank run in Baltimore on an M. It's called the MECU Credit Union, located at 2337 East Northern Parkway in Baltimore. MECU Credit Union. This, this, this credit union is located in a lower middle class neighborhood, predominantly African Americans, predominantly an African American community. Okay? And what was there? There were long lines of cars in the streets. And the people were waiting to get to the bank, not to go inside to get their money. The bank was closed. It was in the afternoon. But to get to the ATM machine so they could take their money out or whatever the limit was. They were afraid. And they're lining up just to get to the, what's the max? $500 you can take out of an ATM machine in a day. They wanted that cash out. Okay. That's social unrest. That's the beginning of it. Now let's go a step further. This particular neighborhood, Donald Trump doesn't like Baltimore. Donald Trump doesn't like Maryland. And at some time in recent months, he sent the National Guard in. They live in tents in certain neighborhoods. They live in this neighborhood, by the way, that I'm talking about, the National Guard. And they're there. They're there in Army uniforms, carrying Army guns. They they have, what do you call them, Humvees, Humvees, uh, with guns on them and everything else to go up and down the street. Now, while these people were taking the money out of the ATM machines, the Humvees were driving around. Isn't that wonderful? Huh? Then you wonder why somebody may want to buy a gun? Okay. They were there in East, ba- in East Baltimore that day. This is, social, this is social unrest beginning, these things like this. Because people have lost their jobs. Can't argue with it. The working public has lost their jobs. The people have lost their jobs. And they're freaking out. Will the banks go down next? And you can't blame them for freaking out. Whoever saw what's happening to this country today? Okay, so the banks, feel, the people feel the banks are going to fail. And big time unrest, in my opinion, could be nearing. And now, these people who are out of work. If they had a 401k, what are they seeing with the market that dropped? I've never in my life, I'm 84 years old, saw the market drop like this so quick, too. And uh, their 401ks have gone from so much money to next to nothing. All right? And the news of a possible recession coming is in the news every day because it is the truth. We are, how can you? If the people aren't working, the nation isn't working, the stock market drops like no one's ever seen it drop before, uh, no one's got any money, the, bank, the government's screwing up, they pass a stimulus package, they can't even get the dough out effectively, people are still waiting. So all that's transpiring right now could be explosive, explosive. There is another example this past week of social unrest in New York City. Two, three weeks ago, uh, the stores are empty. People aren't supposed to, they're all, we got them on stay at home. So the stores boarded up. The stores are boarded up in New York City and in major cities all across the United States. The New York City police announced yesterday 
that burglaries in the city of New York, burglaries are up 75% between March 12th and March 31st in a two and a half week period. Burglaries are up 75% in New York City. And this is even better, supermarkets. They weren't included in that statistic. Supermarkets, for some reason, are a separate entity for the the keeping of data and, and stats. And supermarkets up. The burglaries in supermarkets of food products up 400% in the same two and a half week period. And I said two, three weeks ago, we're going, we're heading for a food shortage. It had to be. You go to the supermarket, forget paper goods, toilet paper, paper towels, tissues. Half the stuff isn't there. They don't have anything. And it gets less and less. And people are hoarding their food. And you can't blame them for hoarding the food. But at some time, there may be nothing or next to nothing to buy. And this is social unrest, and this is going to make people very uncomfortable, and soon they will be fighting for it. And pretty soon, those guns and ammunition may be put to use. I worry about this. Now, let's see what else I want to share with you. Ah, this is a funny one. This is an amusing one. I'm I'm sorry to say it's a funny one. It's a sad one. Uh, The mayor of Alton, Illinois, a community of 25,000 people, is Brant Walker. Uh, He has an order out there, you know, stay at home. And the people haven't been. So he instructed the police, go out there and crack down on any social gatherings. You know, the bars are supposed to be closed. People aren't supposed to get together. uh, And enforce it now. So the first weekend they enforce it. He gets a phone call. 1 o'clock Saturday in the morning, Saturday nights, 1 o'clock Sunday morning. They're in a bar that shouldn't be open. One of the persons they're about to arrest, but they're not sure what they should do, is the mayor's wife. Now, what the hell is she doing out 1 o'clock in the morning on the weekend when her husband's at home or at working? But forget all that. She's out. <coughs> what do we do? <laughs> That's what the police officer asked the mayor. He says, do to her what you're going to do to everyone else. Show her no preferential treatment, which is right. What else could he do? And it's the right thing to do. No one was arrested. They were all issued citations. But they have to appear in court. It's called reckless conduct under their law. It's a misdemeanor, which is a crime, punishable by up to 364 days in jail or a fine of up to $2,500. I assume they're all going to get fined. But you see what the hell happens? The mayor's wife, of all people, should know better. I feel bad for this poor guy who's mayor. All right. I'm running out of time. I never get to finish. I have so many. We're, we're, we've got a food shortage coming. That's one of my. That's my next note, uh, and it's on, it's developing. On Monday, that's yesterday, at a food bank in South Florida, miles of cars lined up on the highway waiting to get to a food bank off the highway. Okay, all right. There has been a surge of six hundred percent in people waiting to get food from food banks in the last week, 600%. Now, it's coming. We're going to have a food shortage. And someday, maybe next week, I'll tie it into Greece, what I saw in Greece when they had food shortages. Anyhow, that's the story for tonight. I hope you enjoyed the show. It's sad things we talk about, but we have to talk about them. We must expose everything that's going on. Uh, You don't have to believe me. Watch television. It tells you everything. Uh, in, the mo- in the morning, I do a blog every day, as most of you know, keywestlou.com. Read it. You'll enjoy it. If you like the show, you like my blog. It's the same thing, more, more detailed, though. In any event, thank you for en- joining me again this week. I always look forward to being with you, and I look forward to being with you again next week.